very much, everyone. Um, sorry to break up such great networking that was going on there. But we've got another fantastic speaker here. Uh, no pressure. Yeah. <laughs> What's been called the granddaddy of Thank you. corporate <laughs> community share issues. Um, old crowd, but a lot of you may have heard of it already. Um, delighted that Julian is going to take us all through that now. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I normally have a picture of him, but I thought I uh, wouldn't do that. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Julian Ross, um, and I'm the chairman of the cooperative that owns the Old Crown, uh, which we all believe to be, including Cooperatives UK, believe to be the first cooperative owned the pub in Britain. Uh, and we bought it in uh, August 2003, so it's uh, eight and a half years ago now. Um, I'm not going to give you a fancy presentation, I'm just going to talk, really, with the aid of a few photographs, and hopefully um, Daniel's going to click when I want him to click, and we'll just move through a few pictures. But basically, I'm just going to tell you what we did, where we are now, and, um, and then take any questions. I'm not here to advertise, I'm not here to sell any shares. However, if you feel moved that you can't leave the building without going on the waiting list, I am your man. Um, and I've got some blatant advertising which is uh, on your tables. Please feel free to take them. Uh, they're just a little leaflets that kind of explain what we did uh, a little bit. Um, the old crown, you, some of you may know it. Um, good, good. Uh, it's in the tiny little village of Heskett Newmarket. Can we click on one picture? Uh, that's Heskett Newmarket, very idyllic. That's on a day when the sun was shining. Yeah, well, that's really the end of May, they, they come. Um, but it's, it's a lovely, lovely little village. Uh, and the next one. When, um, this is, I like to keep this map because it's a, I regard it as a great leveller. Uh, I used it, I used it when I, um, I was asked to go and talk about the old crown in, in the south of Cambridge or Oxford or somewhere. And I thought, well, they're not going to know where Cumbria is, let alone Pesic Newmarket. So I was very pleased with myself. I found this map on the thing. I learned how to scan it and I got it all on the computer and everything. And I just about got to this point and I was about to explain, do you know where I said, do you know where Hesky Newmarket is? And of course nobody did. So I, and that's when I realised it actually isn't on the map. <laughs> 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 so I think that's a good lesson in not getting too big for your boots. Uh, but you all know where it is. That's Caldwick. Uh, there's Carmel, there's Caldwick, there's Finrit. And Hesky Newmarket is a mile and a quarter from, uh, from Caldwick. Um, you might have noticed that I'm not Cumbrian myself. Um, I'm actually half Lancashire, half Scot, because I spent too much time living in the South. Uh, my wife, however, is, uh, she can claim to be, well, she can claim to be Yorkshire because she was born there. She can claim to be Nigerian because she grew up there. But she spent most of her time in Wetherill, um, uh, just east of Carlisle. And uh, she was expelled from two schools and ended up going to Cordue School in, in Dalston. So, <laughs> the only place that could, uh, that could keep her. Uh, and uh, when I met her, it was uh, about 10, 11 years ago. She was living in Cambridge, I was living in the Netherlands, and uh, we came to And uh, she introduced me to Corbeck originally, and then um, we went to Estet Newmarket. Uh, went into the pub, and she met three people she went to school with. So that kind of cemented the connection with um, the old crown. Um, the story, I suppose, should probably start with the next... So is it just a space volume? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, that's just a pretty picture of the interior. You see what you're missing if you don't go. Um, that's sort of where the story starts. Does anybody know who that is? Well, it's Jim Fernley. Um, Jim and Liz Fernley bought the old crown in about 1987. Um, and if I go forward, can I come back with yeah, it? There's, um, there was a shed, a barn, it's called a barn, but it's actually a shed at the back, that, which uh, was empty at the time. And Jim decided, oh, I went too far. Jim decided that he was going to turn it into a brewery. This picture was not long after he turned it into a brewery. He was told that microbrew, this is 12 years ago, I suppose. He was told at the time, don't even think about it, it's a ridiculous thing to do. And he was told pigs might fly if he'd got it going. So there now is still a beer called Pigs Might Fly. It's brewed every now and again. Mm -hmm. And um, he did, all of the beers at that time, and most of them still, are named after the surrounding fells. But from Old Doris. 
Apart from Will Doris, which is the name of the reason I'm uh, his wife's uh, mum. Um, so he hit on this wheeze one day of taking a, a beer to the top of its cell. So in other words, he would take the Skidder special up to the top of Skidder, old Carrick would go to the top of Carrick, etc, etc. Um, <clears throat> they had a hell of a day, uh, and it was a story of quad bikes rolling down fells and getting nearly to the top and the barrel falling off and rolling back down to the bottom. And they got one up to the top, and I don't know which one it is. I think it's Lane Catter, actually. Anyway, it doesn't really matter, it was, as you can see, a murky, misty morning, and he just stood on the top with his barrel of beer, handing out half pints to climb as he got to the top. Um, and you can see from the slightly bemused look on this guy's face, he's just come out of the mist and seen somebody handing him a glass of beer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a story of a, a couple of guys who um, were staying and they, they'd come fell climbing. And every day they set off fell climbing, their wives went shopping. And every day they ended up in the pub because it was rainy or it was foggy or it was too cold and they weren't really dedicated, so they ended up in the pub. Um, and this one day, they finally did do it. And they got up to the top of the thing, and there was Jim handing out his beer. And they took the beer, and then they took another one, and they said, this is terrible. How, I don't, I, and he said, why? He said, well, when we go back down to the bottom, we're going to meet our wives in, in the cafe. We're going to stink a beer. And we've now got to say, no, we haven't been in the pub all day. <laughs> Honestly, we climbed, to the top of, we climbed to the top of a pub. And when we got there, coming out of the mist with this man looking like Moses, handing out points of beer. <laughs> and I thought, how can you not want to save a pub that was created by this guy? So that, that sort of set the scene for uh, wanting to make sure the old crown uh, was, I hate to use the word preserved, but was um, able to continue, if you like. Um, the brewery that uh, Jim started in 87 was sold in 1999. He and his wife wanted to retire. Uh, the brewery was sold in, in um, the, the pub had been sold in the mid 90s. Um, the brewery was put up for sale in 1999, and it was a very high tech and high spec marketing campaign. Uh, Tori and I, and my wife, were in the pub because we used to go up from Cambridge where we were living at the time. We used to go up as often as we could. We were just sitting at the bar one night, and we saw an A4 sheet um, saying the brewery's for sale. Fancy buying it, uh, and you had to put your name down if you were interested. Uh, and as a long story short, 58 of us bought the brewery in 1999 as a cooperative. So that was actually the first cooperative in Hesketh. It was actually the second cooperative in Hesketh Newmarket because there's also an informal cooperative of uh, mothers who own the children's playground. Um, but the, the, the brewery was before the pub. And then in 2001, of course, we all know what happened. Cumbria was echoing to the sound of empty fields, foot and mouth. Um, the owner of the pub. Uh, Kim, his wife died, uh, and he ran it for a year, and he said, I can't do this anymore, so he, he put the pub on the market. So I tried to persuade the brewery to buy the pub. The brewery barely survived from the mouth, because uh, Cumbria, as you know, was pretty much closed. Um, so I then, and the, the, so they weren't able to, to, to buy the pub. So I said to anyone that would listen to me, couldn't we form another cooperative and buy the pub ourselves? And everybody said, that's a good idea. What a great idea. Yeah, brilliant, let's do it. Um, and this went on for several weeks, probably several months. And I realised that if anything was going to happen, somebody was going to have to stand up and do something. So here's the Egypt. Um, I was the one who stood up and suggested that we form a cooperative to buy the pub. Um, I made the suggestion at the brewery AGM, a brewery cooperative AGM, with their permission thinking they'd, <clears throat> and I just on the bullet point list of why I thought we should buy, buy the pub and why I thought we could buy the pub. And I thought, if I get half a dozen people who might be interested, that'll be a success really. And I came out of that meeting with over 20 signatures, uh, people who were, um, who were keen. Um, so I thought, this might actually have legs, as they say. Um, so we started, I suppose, if I say we started a campaign, that sounds very grand, we organised a meeting. Um, and um, then we got the, uh, we're very, uh, there's all these things about serendipity. My next door neighbour was the editor of the, of the Cumberland News, uh, now retired. And I said, um, hey Kim, any chance to put a story in the Cumberland News? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we got a huge spread in the Cumberland News. 
And um, on the strength of that, we got, in the end, we ended up with 125 shareholders within the space of six months, I think. Three, uh, four months, four months from November to March. Um, so that's when we realised it actually was going to work because we'd raised enough, almost enough money to buy the pub without trying it. Um, we then had to set about thinking, God, this looks as if it might happen, what are we going to do? We always knew from the beginning, when I say we, I mean the little steering committee that we'd formed. Also, we always knew that it had to be a cooperative rather than any other community kind of venture. Uh, several reasons for that. The main one being that the brewery had done it and that seemed to work, so we thought, well, that'll do, we'll try that then. Uh, to be honest, we didn't really have much of a clue what we were doing. Um, Dave Hollings uh, gave us a huge amount of help. Howard was involved. Uh, VAC, as it was called then, as it's called something different now, voluntary action company. Lots and lots of uh, help. We also called in people who were in the licence trade. And when they find, when people find out you're doing stuff for nothing, that you're not interested in making money, it's amazing how much help people are prepared to give you. That's what we found in there. Um, we came up with the idea originally of having a manager. We thought, we'll buy the pub, we'll put a manager in, we'll pay the wages, and that'll be us. Um, <clears throat> and we were told very quickly, no, you don't want to do that, you don't want to manage. And you might have heard from Peter this morning that that um, can bring its own issues having a manager. It hadn't even occurred to us at the time. We then would, were wised up and told you really need uh, a lessee tenant. Uh, and it was quite an instruction in governance, really, because we realised that buying a pub is one thing, you then got to actually find a way to run it. And I suppose that, that created, and I will come back to the tenancy in a minute, but it kind of created this, this basic idea that we've had running through the whole project from the start, that it's no good just having shared ideals. That's hugely important, what I call the, the kind of fluffy or cuddly stuff, if you like. Getting people emotionally involved and sharing their own ideals and thinking, no, we might be able to do this. That's hugely important. And I think there isn't a community project anywhere that would exist if, if that wasn't there at the beginning. And then you have to maintain that all the way through, I think. You have to, you have to manage that, I think. Um, but it's equally important to marry that to some kind of business or commercial viability, depending on what your object is. It has to be made sustainable or resilient, because there wouldn't be anything, couldn't be anything worse than getting everybody all fired up and then actually passing with their money, and then finding out six months down the line that it wasn't really feasible anyway, and it's all failed and they've lost their money. So we decided right from the start, really, that, that, that in, in, in this process, that we had to make it feasible as well as appealing. So we, we came up with, when I say we, I mean a guy who was on the committee who was just very good at figures, which I'm not. We came up with two um, business projections, two financial projections. One of them was for us as the owners of the cooperative, and as the owners of the pub, I mean. We realised that if you strip it down into pure business terms, all we do as the cooperative is own a building that happens to be a pub. But in pure business terms, we simply lease out the premises and allow somebody else to use them. Now, the lease obviously stipulates that it can only be used as a pub, that it has to be the old crown and various other things. But basically, that's our business object. Um, and our business projection was to show that we, as the owners of the pub, if we charged rent to our tenants and if we charged them an ingoing premium when they first moved in, which is fairly normal in, in license trade, actually makes them our biggest investor. Um, that that would be sustainable for us. Because as I always say to everybody that I talk to, all we care about, we have no profit motive, all we care about as the owners of the pub is that we have enough money to mend the roof that we need to mend it, pay ourselves a bit of divvy, and know that our pub is there for as long as we want it to be there. For the tenants, it's a different story. They need to make a decent living, and they don't have to have cooperative ideals, they don't have to share our uh, um, views at all. The practice of the reality has shown that most of them do. Um, but our, our business projection for the tenants was a bit of doing that, licking your finger and, and sucking in and see, as it were. But we, we made some assumptions that there were, on, on might be so, because we had no model to go on. We, we had a pub that was being run down with one person running it and no staff, and it was dying on its feet. So we didn't have a model or a template to work with. So we made assumptions about the likely staffing levels, we made assumptions about 
um, outgoings on, on other things. And we, we made a projection that they could make a decent living. In fact, they make a much better living than we, than we projected. Um, but that, that has been vital all the way through, and I think it's vital in every project that um, you have to marry community ideals or shared ideals with viability or sustainability or resilience or whatever that has to be in, manifests itself in a particular situation. Um, we also decided that buying... We decided that buying the pub was just going to be stage one. But uh, that was um, actually that was really nicely Chris Bonington because we, 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 the pub never closed actually. But we thought, and I think that's important in a community project too. Perhaps any project where you've invested a lot of human stuff in it. Um, even though the pub never closed, except for stock taking, we decided we needed a proper opening ceremony. So we gathered everybody together in that school photo that you just saw a glimpse of um, in September 2003. We got Chris Bonington down, who's a, an honorary shareholder, and we did the whole speechifying thing, and he cut a ribbon for us. And um, that one of the pub that says under new ownership, uh, just a previous one, I think, that one, um, had I known that photograph has been all around the world. Oh. Had I known it was going to go all around the world, we would have made this banner. That was, that was it's actually photocopier paper, uh, or fax, fax paper. And my wife did it on, on the bedroom floor uh, on Saturday morning, just before we went to the pub to, to open it. And we just strung it up with bits of twine that we found. Um, had we known, we would have done a much swankier version, but perhaps it wouldn't have the same, uh, the same uh, uh, punch. Um, but we always knew that buying the pub, and great day though it was, that that was stage one. Uh, as part of that viability thing uh, meant that we knew that we couldn't, special though the old crown is, couldn't survive with 16 covers for, for, for meals uh, and half a dozen beers and a, a, a lounge bar, you can put a, a bar that has four tables in it. Um, so we always knew we needed to give our tenants a decent kitchen and a bigger dining area and in 2005 that's what we did, we built on I have not pictures of those because they're not interesting, they're just stuck at the back. But we, we, we built a new dining room on, which is called the garden room. Not because it looks out on the garden, but because it's in what used to be the garden. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, and a kitchen that was as swanky and as big as we could possibly make it. Uh, and we also built, or created, uh, a beer terrace, which we call our plaza, uh, which has two tables on it, or three tables on it. Um, all of that made the financial side of things much more viable. Nonetheless, driving that whole thing and driving the, the, the whole ethos and philosophy behind the old crown is that it's a pub that serves food. It's a real pub that serves food. It isn't a country restaurant that serves beer. And I think that's a hugely important distinction. I mean, there are so many places in Cumbria we're using ourselves. You go for a nice meal on a Sunday afternoon, on a Tuesday evening or something, and there's maybe one locally in there just having a Pint and then he shuffles off because there's nobody to talk to. The old crown, you cannot go in the old crown. It's a physical impossibility, and I've tried it even when I wasn't lonely. You can't go in the old crown and not have a conversation. It simply can't be done. Because if you just sit there like a miserable soul, somebody else will talk to you. So, and, and that to me is what pubs are about, and I think that's what uh, people quite like it. And, you know, the fact that it's cooperatively owned makes it even more unusual. But it's a special place anyway, I think. Um, and I think all we've done is, is, is make that, hopefully make that resilient. Um, it is a success, that's good. Um, we have a fixed, as the owners, we have a very simple model. We have a fixed income stream. We charge our tenants rent. We charge them below the market rent. Uh, we charge them something like 8% of turnover, I think. Um, at, uh, and that's all that we take out of the tenant's business. Uh, we do make them buy beer from the brewery at the back. It'd be daft if they didn't, but that's in the lease. But we have no financial interest in that. They can negotiate whatever deal they, they can. And we allow them to buy anything else from wherever they want, but we do say, please, in Cumbria, if it's available, buy it in Cumbria. And they do. I mean, you can argue that it'd be mad not to buy your meat in Cumbria, but um, it's, in the, it's in the lease anyway. Um, and 
there is a sort of incestuous or, or, or self-sustaining idea behind it, I think. Um, one of the nicest things, we, we used to have, um, uh, I was telling you the other day, I've I forgotten about it, one of our, our oldest shareholders at the time uh, used to get his pension from the post office in the village, go into the pub and spend some of it, and then the pub would take it back to the post office because they banked there. Uh, and put it in uh, the, the same night. And that, that lovely circular thing with, with a pound gaining whatever it is becomes eight pounds or something, doesn't it, by the end of the, the circle. Um, it's really nice, but it, the other thing about it is that every penny spent in the old crown stays either in the immediate vicinity or in, I mean, apart from taxes, VAT and stuff, but nothing that's spent in the old crown goes to buying somebody's BMW in Birmingham. You know, some brewery managers suit. Everything stays uh, local. Um, and that's, that's uh, really quite gratifying. It's also, from the tenant's point of view, proving to be a commercial success. And again, I touch wood, because you just never know. But, you know, the old saying that in a recession, if you can stand still, you're doing well. Well, the old crown has increased turnover every single year since we bought it, including through the recession. Uh, when we took it on, it had a turnover of just about 90,000, and that was going down. Uh, the last turnover figures we had was 259,000. Um, so it's more than tre it's about Trevor. Um, and we think there's scope for more if the, if the, if the tenants really want to go for it. Part of, this, <coughs> part of that's obvious is because we take so little out of the business, I think. Um, and we also make it even a little bit more incestuous because we do pay dividend now, although for the first four years we didn't, uh, and for the first three years we didn't, the fourth year nobody would take any, so for four years we didn't pay any dividend. And then we finally paid 10 quid dividend. Um, we now pay either 40 or 50 pounds, which doesn't sound very much in, in uh, monetary terms, but it's 3.5%. Our shares are all 1,500 pounds, uh, and I'll touch on that briefly in a second. Um, our aim is a return of 5%, which would be £75. The moment we pay 35 because um, we try to err on the side of caution and prudence. But we offer that dividend in two forms. You can either take it as a cash dividend, or you can have it as a voucher that can only be spent in the old crown. Um, so that's quite a, quite a useful uh, little device, really. Uh, our shares are all £1,500, even though we're a cooperative, and they can be anything from £1 to... 20,000, I think. <coughs> well, we took a, a decision which was quite arbitrary that everybody was going to be the same. Nobody would be treated any differently. £1,500 was what the brewery had charged, and we thought, well, that seems to work. Actually, the reason the brewery shares were £1,500 is because it was valued at £80,000, and there were, whatever, I think there were 50 something people interested, and we divided <coughs> it one by the other and it ended up at £1,500. So that'll do. And we thought, well, that seems to work. So we decided to do the same, and it does work. Um, it's a big enough amount for people to think they've got a real stake. It's a small enough amount for people to think, yeah, I can probably do that. We did have people who wanted to pay much more than 1500 and we said, no, everybody's going to have not just one person, one vote, uh, one share, one vote, just nobody's going to be able to buy more than one, one share, <coughs> or one block of shares. But we also had people who didn't have a holiday that year so that they could buy a share, or they grouped together in a syndicate so that they could buy a share. And to me, it was very important that those two things should be exactly equal, that there shouldn't be some people who are able to buy lots and lots of shares and some people who could barely buy a share. We thought there has to be no distinction. On a more pragmatic level, and again, I suppose it comes back to marrying that uh, commercial thing with, with the community thing, we thought if somebody gives us £20,000, that's going to be really, really helpful. It's going to be a bit less helpful if six months down the line they say, can we have it back, please? Mm. didn't even occur to us to tie them in three years that as, as you suggested, would have been a brilliant idea, but that didn't occur to us at the time. So there was, there was, that, there was that pragmatic uh, fear, if you like, that somebody, if they put in a big amount, might ask for the money back. Um, the old crown is doing well, it's going from strength to strength. It's, um, we're now on our third set of tenants, just about to change tenants. Um, Every one of them has made a better living than the people before. And that's indicated by the fact that they pay, as the, as the what's called the premium, the amount they pay us when they take on the lease, is geared to turnover. It's a percentage of turnover. Um, which means that the more the turnover is, the more we pay them back when they go out. 
and every single turnover, every single tenant has made a profit on the lease. In other words, we've had to pay them more for it when they've left than they paid us when they moved in. Um, so that added to the fact that our dividend is going up and turnover is going up. It's quite a good story uh, for us. I mean, we think it's, it's, it, it seems to work as a, as a resilient model. Um, the whole thing has got a huge amount of publicity and that's, and that's never stopped. In fact, it's now become a self-feeding story. I don't ever do anything about marketing or publicity. I just get somebody around me from The Guardian last week. Um, Cumberland News are great friends. They've been brilliant to us. Um, Radio Cumbria, local TV, national TV. And I, I used to ask myself why. Um, and I still don't really know why. Because I just thought, you know, it's a little funny little pub in a funny little village and a few people will buy it and that'll be that. It never even occurred to me that we were doing something that might be seen as important. Um, I mean, it's a pub. It's not a credit union. It's not a correction. It's just it's a pub. Of course, it is much more than a pub. It's the absolute pub of a village like Eskett Newmarket. It's, it's, um, it's a hugely important entity. And when I wrote my um, applications for grant funding, it's amazing the things I thought of that makes the whole ground vital <laughs> uh, to the community and the village. So I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I don't know if I think of that. Um, it taught me several things, the old crown. It taught me, I was actually amazed and humbled by what people can achieve. I mean, that's the one thing I learned. You, you can do it. It can be done. Um, I think there's a sort of, I think we tapped into a sort of anti mcdonaldization thing. You know, this thing where there's a Tesco's on every roundabout and pubcos were buying up pubs by the score and brewery chains and stuff. And I think it was just this sense of, this is just a tiny little one and you're not getting this. I think there was, I think there was a sense of that. Um, the fact that people are, going to get a ret are getting a return was very, very minor, I think. People still, there are still people now who don't take their dividend. And we still have at least one person who's never actually been to the pub. Um, she just thought it was such a brilliant idea that she wanted to be, to be part of it. And that's, actually, we, we, we've got shareholders in Spain, we've got shareholders in Germany, the States, um, from the north of Scotland to the south of England, all of whom bought into it because they think it's a good thing to do. And it taught me something about community, actually, because we tend, I certainly thought of community as all the people in a village or all the people in the street. Um, and I think I realised that community is much more about shared values and shared ideals. Because when we, when we, those 90 odd people that were on that photograph that came together were from all over the, all over the place, really. So there were people in Edmund's Bay. To me, they're all part of the same community, even though we don't see each other every day or every week. Um, I suppose another thing it taught me is that if you want anything doing, you've got to do it yourself, as my mother used to say. Um, a, there, there is a saying, and it's probably a Yorkshire saying, I tend to think of it as a Lancashire saying, um, and it's, uh, he who suggesteth payeth, uh, and in our case it was he who suggesteth doeth. So in other words, if, you, if, you're the, if you're the fool that suggests the idea, you're likely to end up doing it. Um, and that's probably true, and I think you shouldn't be scared of it. I think it, if you are prepared to stand up, what happens is you end, up, you end up having to do it. You end up being default chairman like I am still, and they haven't got rid of me yet. But what also happens is that once people, once, all you have to do is show people that, convince people that it can happen. And then it's amazing, people just gather around, and what's driven this project from start to finish, not me, I've been, if you like, the boneheaded one who wouldn't listen to anybody saying that's difficult or whatever. But what's driven this project from the start has been the members, the shareholders. Every time we've had a problem, um, particularly in the, the run-up when we didn't know if it was going to happen or not, we had meetings, we got together, and every single time it was the members who said, go for it. And that's hugely empowering, I think. Um, I think I've got to stop there because I'm rabbiting on too much. So. If it's okay, I'll stop there and maybe take questions. Is that okay? For yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got time for a couple of questions. Can you share any of the tools with us? Vivian, you were saying there was a problem with the shells and getting the shells together and they all bailed around. But there was also things you can't do. I'm completely boneheaded. Right. I, th I think I just saw... I think I just saw obstacles as... Another uh, audit? Uh, yeah, Open. yeah, I think so. Uh, the price changed. The price we negotiated changed. Um, 
uh, but we had a survey and we had to do some negotiating on the price. I think, I think the biggest pitfall that I've, that I've banged on about, and it applies to every single community project I've ever come across, is that right at the very beginning, people don't know what to do. And they say, yeah, pubs closing, or no broadband, or whatever. But what do we do? Um, once they've decided that they might want to do something, and it might involve coming together, because when you come together, that's when solutions get resolved, actually. Because people, there's always somebody who's got an idea or a solution, and you brainstorm, you kind of one of the biggest problems is that much money. Um, because quite often, in order to spread the word about an idea, you've got banal stuff, you have to buy postage stamps, you have to pay for printing. In our case, we have to pay for a membership of Cooperatives UK. Now, we were very fortunate, I was able to pay all, cover all of those costs. Um, but a lot of organisations struggle just on that, for the sake of 500 quid, really. Um, and I've often said, you know, probably not been uh, well received in some <laughs> arenas. But you know, I used, to, I used to look at people standing at Ed Miliband's one, they used to stand up in Parliament and say, you know, we're making 10 million pounds available for the third sector. And I, yeah, but you won't give this group 300 quid just for, on a flyer. You know, which is, that's, that's one of, I think, one of the huge obstacles, quite often. It's uh, interesting what you said there, because the, um, I work with community of land trusts and um, community of land trusts movement set up CLT fund um, without government, it was done with charitable support and it provides what you were talking about. Um, and so you get two and a half thousand pounds set up grant, then you get thirty thousand pounds loan that can be written off, and then you can get development finance. But um, nobody else is prepared to provide that. God, I wish we'd known about you. Well, <laughs> the problem is that even they have limitations, so if, unless your project involves at least 50% of affordable housing, you can't yeah. apply for it. So, this is, I think, the problem. If, if all of these organisations would get together um, and, and try to provide a universal yeah. fund, or uh, you know, at least try to, you know, small amounts of money, just like you say, will help to get all around. And not everybody wants to start with affordable housing. No. You know, some people do want to start with a pub or a lot of them. So, so it's there's a need for joined up yeah. kind of thing, yeah. isn't there? Um, I didn't quite understand the, how this rent and premium work. It's quite well, what, what normally happens when a, when a tenant takes on a pub, yeah. they buy the lease. They buy the business. They buy the business, yeah. Um, and they pay what's called a premium for that. And that's 8% of the tenant? Well, in a, uh, no, that's the, 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 once they've bought the, the, the lease, that's a negoti negoti negotiable amount. Um, well, what, I, uh, what we did in, in the, and, uh, sorry, but just to finish answering your question, they then pay annual rent as well. Without, without increasing the property. Well, the way we have it structured is that we set the rent for three years, yes. and then we have an external valuer come in who tells us what the market rent is, and then we charge a bit less, um, simply because we don't care about making money. The market we rent will be Partly to profitability, the area it's in, and I don't yeah. know. They'll have formulas that they use for this. So then to answer that question, um, how did we set the, the price? Well, somebody told us what, it, what we should charge. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, what, what we did in, in the very first year, they said, uh, um, this, you should be charging 20 to 25, so we charged 15. Uh, and they said, your rent should be £12,000 a year. Um, but you might think about stepping it, starting at 8,000, then going to 10,000, then going to 12,000, just as a kind of sweetener. And we did that, but in fact, in the first year, we halved it, and we only charged 4,000 pounds. And that was really because, uh, just to underline the fact that we want happy tenants. And what we always do, if there's any benefit of any doubt to be given, we give it to our tenants. Uh, and we're quite benign landlords, I think. How many shareholders do you have? We have 100, one's just cashed in, so we have 147 at the moment. And a waiting list, which is endless, so, as I said in the beginning. Yeah. So, there are 147 places coming in what? Not really. We, we, we needed, we, we needed uh, 125 uh, to buy the pub, 124. Uh, and then when we built an extension, we discovered that's another pitfall, I suppose. We discovered that because we got a bit of grant funding to buy the pub from the, <coughs> from the Lake District and from the Cumbria County Council. The one organisation that turned us down was. Oh, you know, ironic. Um, but when we wanted to build the extension and the new kitchen, which was what was needed to secure the business we thought, 
we couldn't get continue what they could think of as continuation funding. Um, so we increased the number of shareholders then to, to, uh, to finance it ourselves. And that, that's why we have a, a waiting list, because who knows, we might need to raise more money. We do have an infinite, well, we have a sort of infinite number of shareholders. Our rules set uh, the share capital at a, uh, a certain limit, although we can change that if we wish, but uh, that's capped in the, in, the, uh, in the rules, the charter, if you like. And it's still 1,500 pounds? Yes, it is. If you bought it 10 years ago for 1,500, you can still buy a share for 1,500. You certainly can, and if you cash in, you still have 1,500 quid. Which you wouldn't in every investment. And you've had a return every year since, and you've been able to use your own book. Do you mean the, the, the growing the old crown? Not the old crown, but just as taking over the world. Touch base with yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I suppose what, what we do in with, so far it's been in a very informal way. I, I go to events and talk. Um, I people get in touch with me if their pub is closed. I go and talk to them, and, and there are, there are several that have the, the Peter Ennerdale was a case in point. I went to a meeting there one cold February. Uh, and if you've got somebody standing in front of you who said, look, it can work, we did it, uh, then that's a great, you know, you can't deny that. Uh, I did a thing in Leeds and there was about a shop, and people bought their shop and that now runs as a co-op very successfully. So there's been that kind of informal thing, but just about three weeks ago we had a, the Plunkett Foundation, they were very interested in what we're doing, and they organised a networking event because there are now nine cooperatively owned pubs in Britain. Uh, and I think all of them took the old crown as their model. Um, in one way or another. So the idea is, is to get some kind of joined up network thing so that we don't all have to, so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. So that they, so we can kind of have a serious, like what you call it, signposting system so that if people have a problem, the idea would be to set up a central website so that um, they, they know where to go. That's that wasn't really an answer to my own question. Um, well, why, why, when you had all this potential investment, why not throw everything? I suppose, I suppose because um, when we started, we didn't know where it was going anyway. And our sole object, and it's actually written in our, in our rules, is to own the old crown. That's, that's why we exist. Um, so we would have to change the object of our... And, and we're not ambitious. All, we've got what we wanted. We just want the old crown there. Thanks. That's yeah. <laughs> all we want. I suppose it's a good to be too ambitious. Well, that's a great danger, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Certainly going to have for us. Okay. Right, I've got to... Sorry, did you have one more question? Uh, do you also contribute John McKinney's things in the village? So do you say uh, yes, we do. And um, that's also in our rules that we, we um, will give money to the community project. Uh, and we, we sponsor people who are doing stuff. And yeah, we do in a small way so far, but the, the, that's one of the plans we have now is to start increasing that now. We're on a slightly more consolidated basis. Yeah. And we own a share in the NFL hub. Mm -hmm. And in the brewery, and the brewery owns a share in the pub. Mm -hmm. Right, I'll. Uh... Okay, thanks very much.